Okay, well, uh, let's start with a hearty J Baba. So the Mandali have played a very important part of my life um, since the very earliest days. But what has struck me recently is who are the Mandali? How do we describe the Mandali? How do we identify who the Mandali are? Yeah. Um, because there are many people who have a history of going to India that the Mandali were just those people who lived with Baba. However, Baba had referred to other people as his Western Mandali. For instance, a woman by the name of uh, Ann Forbes, who lived in Miami. Baba said she was one of his Western Mandali. Oh, wow. So I think it's really important that, for me, it was important to begin to really think about what that is, what it means. And as I was searching, I found this in Lord Mayhair. It's the USA edition, volume 12, page 4277. The one who gives his life to me, who listens to me and is ready to obey me, who does not ask for any reward nor care for the result, whether he is ruined or prospers, who takes my pleasure as his pleasure, but at the same time, whose intimacy I also feel, such a one is a Mongoli member. Mm -hmm. Mayor Baba. Thank you. And I think the other thing that's critical for me, as I say, this is something I spent a lot of time with because the Mongoli have been uh, directly uh, influential in my life with specific instructions uh, that sometimes I haven't even realized until now things that they may have told me 30 years ago. And I'm going, wow, I'm beginning to see this now, why this happened. Here's a, an interesting, for instance, this just, and as I say, I, I think the Mandali, the Mandali like us, are all human who are making the ascending journey to God. God, the avatar, descends. So even though our consciousness eventually is to meet as each of us attains union, but it's always for us ascending, not descending. And the Mandali, regardless of whether it was Kitty or Elizabeth, or Mera, or Mani, those are ascending. Those are people going up. So for that reason, I think the Mandali, what they had to say to us was critically important and still resonates because they give us hints on how to please Baba and how to <coughs> obey him and how to love him. Uh, as Eric used to tell me, he said, involve Baba in everything you do. He said, if you're making lunch for yourself, just imagine, Baba, would you like a sandwich? Did you, did you eat, did, did you like tuna fish? You know, the Mara, until the very end, would not even take a sip of tea without offering it to Baba first. So we still can do that. We can still involve him. Now, in Forbes, one of the reasons why I mentioned her, I met her way back in the early 70s living in Miami. And she told me this story that she had gotten a cable from Baba that Baba wanted her to collect a certain number of a particular item called fizzies. Fizzies were in a little packet like this different flavors, they were effervescent. You dropped it in water, it would bubble up. So she gets this cable from Baba that Baba wants a certain number, whatever that number is, I don't remember. On a Sunday evening between this hour and this hour, 
And Ann told me that she got in the car and started driving around, and wherever she went, because in those days there were also blue laws, so a lot of places were not open, it was Sunday. So she would find one packet here, she would go someplace else, there would be none, she'd go someplace else, she'd find two. She said eventually she got the required amount just before the time limit expired. She cabled Baba, she had done that, Baba cabled back, he was very pleased with her. She never sent them. She found out years later that she, she said, I was looking at a map and I realized I had driven around the entire city of Miami. And what happened is so many Baba people were drawn to Baba from that time. She said, and I think of, you know, Baba had made comments one time, we would send somebody someplace, Herbert Davy, and Baba said he was laying cable. He sent Herbert Davy to China. So, you know, I, I look at that. Now, how we can involve Baba still in our life? It's a pack of fizzies. <laughs> <laughs> I found this at, uh, um, what's the little breakfast lunch place that's around here, Cracker Barrel. <laughs> so they've got all these the candies from the place. I'm walking around there one day and I'm looking, it's fizzies. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, we call it silly, but on the other hand, I keep this next to a photo of Papa. It becomes a form of meditation. Anything can become a form of meditation. And uh, there's one, one story that I, the Mandali, various Mandali would ask me to tell them stories. Because I had the great good fortune, just the way life works for each of us. I was a hairdresser, so I used to do the ladies' hair when I would go to India. So I would, after everybody would leave, I got to sit in the back with the ladies. And Mani would be on a typewriter, and all the ladies would line up, and I would cut their hair. Ron on, all of them, you know. And I would hear things uh, this way. It was an intimacy. Uh, here in the States, uh, I got to that same opportunity uh, with, with men, with, uh, with um, Kitty, I, I did Kitty's hair. Uh, and just a little, so every kind of tiny bit of intimacy we can get with them, which I think is still available. That's the point. The point is it's still available. So now this quote that I read to you, and why I bought this book. So uh, those of you here, I'm sure many of you know uh, Roger and Wanda, who just moved here. Wanda is Bill um, Stevens' uh, daughter. Yeah. And, and uh, parts of the daughter-in-law, Rogers' son. Okay, so they just bought an apartment in the same building that I'm in. I, I haven't seen them in years. I knew Darwin way back, Darwin Shaw, way back from years ago. I was never close to Darwin. Um, Roger, as he's unloading his car, he said, Nick, he said, I found something that belongs to you. And I said, really? He said, I found something. I was going through my father's things. And it is a signed copy of Darwin's book to me with my name in it. And what I've already read out of this has deeply touched me because <clears throat> these are things that are pertinent to me I have conversations with people. I've read, like many of us, I'm, I don't mean to sound exclusive here, many of us who have been with Baba a very long time have read things and heard things, and I can't remember oftentimes the source. So recently, <laughs> so recently I was at dinner, and uh, 
and the, and the so politics came up. And I have this aversion to conversations about politics because I knew that I had read years ago that Baba said, stay away from party politics. Do not get involved with it. But I actually had somebody not so long ago, very, very close to Baba, say to me, that rule only is regard to the center. And Baba never said that about anything else. So, would you hold this, please? So now I get this book. This is from Baba, January 1st, 1949. Although I am in everyone and in everything, and my work is for the spiritual awakening of all mankind, I am always aloof from politics of any kind. My disciples and devotees should continue as before to abstain from taking part in political activities or discussions. Mm -hmm. yes. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. That covers all of us. That covers it, I would say. Did he say that right to Darwin, or is that a circular? It's something? a circular that Adi sent out from Baba. Um, Can you say it again? Sure. Just before the start of the new life. Wow. Although I am in everyone and in everything, and my work is for the spiritual awakening of all mankind, I am always aloof from politics of any kind. My disciples and devotees should continue as before to abstain from taking part in political activities or discussions. Hmm. For me, and this was when I was told this, when I heard this, because I believe it was something that came up uh, in India, because money actually, I had not voted. Um, when I, my first trip to India, I had voted in any election, even though I had already been in the service, military service, Mommy asked me if I voted. She said, you must vote. So, you know, you have your obligation to fulfill, but no conversation. <laughs> you make whatever decision you want to make, you certainly can ask, but you don't try to influence somebody else. And what I got from it is that politics is divisive, mm -hmm. and we are supposed to be interested in unification. Truth is one. That's where we should be heading, is to try to find what makes us, what's the similarities between us and not the differences. So when we identify ourselves as a Christian, we're denying that we're Jews. If we identify ourselves as Jews, we're denying we're Christians. If we identify that we're one, political party with denying by the other political party. So I think that my own sense is that it's best to stay, as Baba said, stay aloof from it. I don't know where I read it or heard it, but I seem to remember that um, Baba said, you know, he's on both sides of every side argument or whatever, and that everybody thinks they're right, and that's why they're on it, and that to take sides is pretty ignorant basically, are limited. I, I heard, I, I can't confirm this is one of the things I'm hoping to confirm. And again, that's why I keep going back rereading these things as much as I can. Uh, Dr. Kenmore had asked Baba one time, this was during, I think, the Nixon years, who he should vote for. And Baba told him, it doesn't matter who you vote for, he said, I've already decided. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> But we still need to vote. It's the duty. The duty. You know, Bao was always, when he would stay with us, uh, he would, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to introduce my daughter. For those of you who don't know her, that's Marie. Uh, and I've asked her if she would be willing, because 
Dow stayed with us about eight or nine times. Oliver stayed with us. The twins have, have been there. Um, you know, um, Meru, Katie were all at our home. And, and we've had meetings there where there were 200 people. Yeah. Uh, Marie grew up with Bao as her grandfather. Aww. So I've asked Marie if she would be, if she was something she wanted to share. Yeah, he told me about an hour before I got here, well, if you want to say something, you know, <laughs> no pressure. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that if he had told me well in advance, I could come up with a whole number of stories and insights and things to offer. And because of being, you know, a little, um, not in a bad way, but a little, you know, on the spot, I'm thinking whatever just comes out is, is probably was natural, right? What's supposed to? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think like a lot of us who were fortunate to spend time with the Mandali, it was always a very loving and accepting space, even if they were firm with us and clear, at least my experience, was that it was still loving and accepting. And I, just on the topic of politics, since we're in that space, I work in DC, I've been there off and on for 10 years, and um, it's, a, it's a difficult place to be and not be involved in politics <laughs> and not want to talk about it. And I work in international development, so it's constant. Um, and I remember for the longest time until I was 18 or so, I was convinced I was going to be a doctor. And that was, you know, then I took chemistry. So, you know, <laughs> changed majors and it went a different route. <laughs> but I remember thinking, okay, well, you know, politics sounds interesting, political science, the way that people organize themselves and how we make things work for us, whether it be schools or roads or hospitals. I mean, it's just a fascinating the way that we construct our our existence, in some ways very supportive of each other, in other ways not so much. And I struggled with what I had understood Baba to say not to get involved in politics. And I thought, well, I want to be involved in it because I want to make things better. I didn't realize I get emotional when I say this. Um, and I asked the twins, because we saw the twins at, um, at someone's house in Chapel Hill, and I said, I'm really struggling with this because I feel pulled to be involved in this space where I feel like I can add value, and I, I don't know if it's right. And they, and they said, no, it's fine. <laughs> I said, it's fine. You know, don't get involved in party politics. And um, I, I feel like it's my responsibility to vote. That's, that's just for me. Everyone feels differently and has a right to feel differently because I also, from what Dad has shared with me growing up, that Baba had said, whatever you read about me doesn't matter if it doesn't resonate with what's in your heart. So that being true to yourself is, is paramount. Um, so I think that there's a, a way to be involved in the things that we feel pulled to, to be, to add value, to, to use the gifts or the um, blessings that Baba has given us in a way that helps him do his work and at the same time preserves us from contributing to divisiveness. And um, the twins and the Mandali in the past have helped sort of put up you know when you go bowling as a child and they put up the, the bumpers on the side so when you bowl, the ball doesn't go off into the gutter. If I didn't have those, the ball would always go in the gutter <laughs> to this day. I need those bumpers. And, and the Mondelez for me were, were the bowling ball bumpers. Very so. good. Yeah, nice. So I'm gonna take a little different tack now, if I may. <clears throat> Just uh, because I need the challenge. So I would ask, <clears throat> if anybody has a particular topic, and I'll see if I can find some memory uh, that might relate to that from a Mandali, or if you ask me about a particular Mandali person. And before I do that, I have one story, though, that I must share, because um, Bao had told me, Bao used to ask me when he would stay with me, when we were, after everybody would go in the evening, we would drink wine, <laughs> which not many people knew, but he was. <laughs> and uh, and we tell stories. And because Bao was kept so busy by Baba, he had very little exposure to some of the other Mandali. 
And even among the Mandalay, even Adi would say, until just before Baba dropped the body, he said, they hadn't even talked to Mara. He was cousin to Mara, and they never talked because they were so secluded, the women from the men. So Bao asked me to tell a story. And this was the story I told him about. He wanted to know about Zhao because I spent quite a bit of time with Baba's brother Zhao, with Marie's mother, Beth, who many of you know. So we would, in those days, there was no pilgrim center. We would stay at Loa Marabad in the, they put us up in the different places. Baba's cabin, um, somebody would get to stay at the end where Muhammad's room was, or the dispensary, all these different, we, and there were only a half a dozen people. First time I went, there were six Westerners. There were more Mandali than there were Westerners. So we would have to, we'd go there Monday, we could stay Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Friday we had to leave, and what her mom and I would do is we'd take the bus and we'd go to Pune, and we'd spend the weekend with Jal, with Baba's brother. <clears throat> and he would choose, it would be in a different, he would put us up in a different hotel. He, we didn't know what hotel, see them. So he would pick a hotel for us, and then he would go examine it, make sure the place was clean. So we stayed in this one hotel, and we had no idea when we would get to Pune, we would always call, we would go to the National Hotel, and we would meet him at the National. We called him, and he'd come to the National. So this one, we've done that, we got there, he takes us, we get in a rickshaw, we go to his hotel. And there's a beautiful staircase, the lobby's downstairs, beautiful staircase, going up to the first floor. And we walk up, uh, I don't recall there was a, no elevator, I don't think. So we walk up, and our room is at the top of the stairs, just on the left. And um, he goes in, checks the room, it's clean. He gives us particular instructions. He says, now, I'm gonna leave, you lock the door. Then I'm gonna say J Baba, you say J Baba, and don't open the door until I come back. <laughs> and he would do this two or three times a day because we'd go for lunch, we'd go for tea, we'd go just for a wander around the city, we could take us on a bus ride uh, around the city of Pune for whatever reason, I have no idea. I mean, because he sat behind us, feeding us candies. <laughs> Her mom and I sitting here, he told us not to turn around, and we went all around the entire city of Pune, and he would reach behind us, between us, and hand us these little candies that had MB on them. Oh. Yeah. yeah, they looked like uh, like the fizzies, little, mm -hmm. little round thing. And I remember one, you ask your mom, dropped on the floor. Oh. And there's a bus in India. <laughs> and John said, pick it up and eat it. <laughs> your mom, she looked at it and said, really, John? I said, yes, say Baba's name. <laughs> I bet she's never done that since. <laughs> Not without saying Baba's name. <laughs> so we get in one evening, and he tells us now, and this was every weekend, we'd go on like this, because we were there for the summer. We were there almost three months. So now he tells us he's leaving at night. He's now in the morning. I will be here at 7 o'clock. You wait for my knock on the door. When you hear the knock, you say J Baba, I say J Baba, and only then do you unlock the door. Now, being the kind of person that I am, because I think I know better than everybody else, <laughs> uh, I'm, the next morning we're up early, we're ready, and I said, why don't we go downstairs uh -oh. Uh -oh. and meet him downstairs? And that said, Nick, he said to wait here. I said, yeah, but he's an old man, which now I dread saying that because I'm older now than he was then. <laughs> and he was walking up and down that flight of stairs <coughs> two, three times a day. I said, we'll meet him downstairs. It'll save him from walking up. The, okay, she's, I'm not sure about this. I said, come on, it'll be fine. 
The minute I open the door, it's now about five minutes to seven, and he is just putting his foot on the top step. He turns and looks, and all I can say is this look of disappointment on his face. He said, where are you going? I said, John, we're gonna meet you downstairs. He said, but what did I tell you? And I repeated it. He said, you don't understand. He said, you're my responsibility. He said, if anything happened to you, Baba would not be happy with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, he then, he said, go back inside. Locked the door. <laughs> he went downstairs. Oh, jeez. <laughs> After a minute or two, knock on the door, I looked at my watch. It was exactly 7 o'clock. <laughs> Jay Baba, Jay Baba. He never said a word half the time about that incident. But when I told Bao that story, he said, you make sure you tell everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. The importance of fulfilling your duty. Wow. That's how I took it. How, Baba gave him a job to do because Baba had instructed Jal to be his emissary for Westerners. That's why Jal stayed in Pune. He said, you might you be made my emissary for Westerners. So if anybody's got a question about any, yeah. Um, did you know his other brothers, Adi, Ube, Raman, the one brother who was adopted I yeah I did not I, I did not I had met Adi I did not know Baram Baram had already passed uh, Jal was became sort of a surrogate father for the twins and uh, so yeah but I never I never met uh, the others their offspring and wives yes Tell us, uh, tell us a prankster story of the twins. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, when, uh, and, and I think many of these, especially with the twins, are, are sort of published. But the, uh, the, the one that I remember is that when they were teenagers and mischievous, as teenagers would be, and they knew that they had a certain intimacy with Baba. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you remind me, I'll tell you one about Mommy, where she overstepped her bounds. Mm -hmm. And the twins, when I told the twins, they did not believe the story. And it was only years later that it's now in print. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the twins, Baba had a darshan program at Guru Prasad and people would take off their sandals before going in. <laughs> and the twins went around and took one sandal from everybody and threw it up on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so they came out and they had one, everybody could find one shoe and couldn't find the other. Couldn't find the matching one. Mani said that when she was a child, and this is in uh, now um, Heather's book, which is, when I say it's just now printed, but I heard Mommy tell this in Mobley Hall and the twins when I told them, they said, I'm telling you this never happened, I never heard it. Mm -hmm. Until afterwards when they saw it in print, they said, okay. Mm -hmm. Which has its own special meaning because that means that whatever you hear, you still can hear something else. Mm -hmm. There's still more stuff out there waiting to come out. Mm -hmm. But Mommy said that she was about 10 years old and she was always very excited when she would get to be with Baba. And she said, I always knew my brother was God. Mm. So she showed up, wherever it was, I don't know, uh, whether it was Guru Prasad or Mirazad, but it was, uh, and she said, and Mani was great at doing a little pantomime. And she said, here she was, a 10-year-old, walking, you know, swinging her arms, just walking right up to Baba stretched out her arms to embrace Baba, and Baba hauled off and slapped her in the face. And Mani said that she could still feel, that, that she said he hit her so hard, 
used to, she said, I can still feel the imprint of his hand mm. on my face. And she said she was so shocked that she immediately turned around and ran back to hide behind the women. Mm. And after a while, somebody said, Baba wants you. Mm. And she said, I stood there. <laughs> no, she's not going to go. They went and told Baba, and Baba said, bring her. Again, two or three times, finally, she went there. And Baba pointed to her sandals. He said, nobody approaches me without taking off their sandals. Mm. And I think of that. We say prayers, we leave our shoes on. And I think to myself, even though I do the same thing, I think to myself, that's not the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. The best way to say the prayers is take the shoes off. Mm -hmm. It's to be barefoot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why one of the, one of the important um, sort of functions of Mangali is for, because it's that reminder that we can never take Baba for granted. But one of the favorite, my favorite gestures, Baba would, uh, and I can still see Erich doing this, he would say, Baba would say, never forget. He said, I am God. This was Baba's gesture for God. <coughs> never forget. Because they would forget, the Mandali would forget. Because they took him for granted. Um. Well, I'd like to know if you met Baba, and if not, how did you come to Baba? I found out about Baba in uh, 1968. Um, I had friends who were traveling overland to meet Baba. Um, I was um, I had friends who were in communication with Baba. Uh, I did not get the opportunity go to meet him. As a matter of fact, when I came to Myrtle Beach, the first time I came to Myrtle Beach, which was the spring of 1969, and everybody was getting ready to go to the Darshan, I didn't even know, I didn't know Bob had dropped the body. There were no groups. Where I was, there was no groups. Where were you? I was in Florida. And, and, the, and this is, a, I think, another thing that's very important that's hard for us to imagine now. One can go online now, if you want to find out what Baba said about mm -hmm. eating pork chops, you can go find out if Baba <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do Google searches on that all the time. What did, what did Baba say about, you know, the Mongoli? That's one of the things I did. Uh, you know, so in those days, there was, that when I found out about Baba, there were, I believe, five books available was the three volume discourses, God Speaks, Jean Adriel's book, and Purdom's book. Mm. And I thought that was it. So the way we found out about Baba was to go talk to the Mambali. They were that bridge between Baba's physical life and his printed life. Because I, there were no films. I didn't, first film I ever saw of Baba was at the center, mm. you know, now they're, you know, people have them in their living room. Mm. Or it's on YouTube. <laughs> on YouTube, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were you, were you a seeker, or were you prior to Baba, were you seeking God or seeking spirituality, just? Uh, when I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a Franciscan. Mm. And I thought that St. Francis was the coolest thing I had ever found out about. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, mm, <laughs> and I, my, now my Italian mother, you know, the Jewish mothers want their sons to be doctors. Italian mothers want their sons to be priests. <laughs> so I told my mother that I wanted to be a Franciscan. It was the only book, you know, there were, I'm, I'm going to be 77. There was no, no, the only books I had in my home 
were uh, the encyclopedia, which I read two or three times from one end <coughs> to the other, because there was nothing else to read. There were no magazines. Um, I mean, it was not something my parents were interested in. My mother gave me a book of the saints, and that was how I discovered St. Francis. I told her I wanted to be a Franciscan. She arranged to have a Franciscan come to the house. It was, um, the, the, pro, the time comes, <clears throat> we're anxiously looking out the window, and this big, fancy black Buick or Oldsmobile pulls up. And I'm looking to see some little barefoot guy with a hair shirt, you know, and a rope around his waist. And out steps this six foot, 250 pound Irishman with a tailored suit. And he, of course, comes in and my mother is falling all over herself to make him feel comfortable when he's does his little speech, and then he, and I'm really bewildered about all this as a child. And finally he asked me if I had any questions. And I said, yeah, I do. I said, I, he said, well, ask me anything, son. I said, but I thought Franciscans had to take a vow of poverty. Oh. And I could see my mother start to cringe. <laughs> he said, oh, Yes, my son, he said, we all take vows of poverty. I said, but you're driving a nice car. <laughs> he said, oh, son, this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. <laughs> and it was my awakening to hypocrisy. <laughs> and I, so at that point, uh, but I, I, I was struck by how Francis had contact with Jesus a thousand years after his death. Mm -hmm. That part, somehow or other, that settled in my head. Now my, as many of you know, I now have this newly, fairly recently developed passion for Italy, which is my, my heritage. My first trip to India when I met Mommy the very first time, she said, my, my parents introduced us. Nick, this is Mani, <clears throat> of a sister. Mani said, Nick, last name? And I told her, Princi Principe. She said, Principe, Italiano? I said, yeah, in Italian, Principe. She started speaking to me in Italian. <laughs> and when I stood there with this sort of <laughs> blank look on my face, she said, you don't speak Italian. I said, no. She said, you must learn Italian. Uh -huh. Now, I have struggled with that till now. And now we're in the process of getting Italian citizenship. Mm. Whoa. And I think that it, I honestly believe that trigger from Mani to, to become involved with Italy, even though that was 1976, I never went to Italy except to go through the airport until five years ago when Marie and I went for the first time. So all those years, but I, it was on my mind, and periodically I would find some book about you know, Italian, I would try to pick up a few words here and there, but now I'm, I'm now sort of okay now, get off your lazy ass and do it. <laughs> because the Mazzoli would almost never ask you to do anything. I mean, unless you were working there, if they gave you a job to do, certainly. But for those of us who were pilgrims, I, they never gave us, you know, at least to me they didn't. They may have other people, but they didn't give me tasks to do. So I'm thinking to myself, this is the one thing that Monty asked me to do. I have to do this before I die. Mm -hmm. So say something in Italian. <laughs> Most of what I know in Italian, I can't repeat. <laughs> Street language. How do you say, don't worry, be happy? Uh, oh. You know what, next time I see you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll do some well, research. I have two cute stories about Joe. Okay. Because you're just not, can't think of it. Because you? <laughs> you just use it. I mean, they're just, they're just cute. Very cute. Um, so, uh, 
at Baba House in New York, representing <laughs> represent. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, there was a woman named Govinda, if you remember oh, Govinda, yeah, yeah. Yep. and she had been to the sixty-nine Darsha, yeah. not not East. No, sixty-nine Darsha. But Govinda is. Govinda is that was she gave herself the name. But for Govinda. who doesn't know Govinda? Yeah. It's what, a name what, to us, what to us then was an older person, she's younger than most of us now, she was at that point, oh, okay. was like a 50 <laughs> something year old hippie. Govinda wore like long dresses. She was, yeah. We thought she was old because we were all 20. You know, long hair, beads, and she was a hippie and she floated around the room. Yeah, she was great. And, um, and she wrote a book, children's book, anyway. Um, but Govinda, which we didn't know at the time, is another name for Krishna, Govinda Gopala. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, she wrote a letter to Jal, and um, some letter, conversational letter, and she wrote, I don't know if you remember me, but <coughs> ba 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 da 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 letter. And then she got a letter back from Jal. <laughs> Of course I remember you, dear brother Govinda. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, Govinda is a guy. <laughs> right. Jokes that he told, list of jokes, and, and a description of all the Baba places. And yeah. And he was like the mayor of Central Pune. You know, he knew everyone and take you to this store, and they all knew him. They'd go to this restaurant, that hotel, the National, and the Green. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of shocking for that time. Laurel and we weren't going together at the time. We were just sort of together in India. And we came to Pune and needed a room. And all of a sudden, Jal brought us to the Green Hotel. Brought us upstairs and said, there's your room. Goodbye, good night. <laughs> we both went in the room. Laurel said to me, get over there, stay over there. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Did he tell the whole lock the door and J-Baba, J-Baba? No, 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 never. Wow. So I actually do remember a, a very, uh, again, to me, was incredibly important uh, uh, Jal story at the time. So after spending three months in India, and there, just before we went, we had a child that died, a newborn, um, which um, was, we were completely spoiled by the Mandali when we got to India. When they mm -hmm. knew about this, they just could not do enough for us. They were hand, literally hand feeding us. Yeah. Uh, you know, fruits and Mara would take, and Dr. Goa would take Beth in the back and give her tea and take care, make sure she lay mm -hmm. down and rest. Mara would send out plates of fruit to me and tell me not to share it with anybody, <laughs> which was embarrassing because here's everybody, you know, and again, not many people, but I get this tray, somebody, Casey or whoever was there would bring it out. It was a tray with custard apples. So completely spoiled, completely spoiled. So now, and when we went, because of the emotional trauma we had gone through, we didn't own anything, we sold everything, we had a car, an old car, we, our few belongings, we left in the car, the trunk leaked, we left that with Jim and Debbie Meyer. We got back and everything in the trunk was ruined. It was, so now we spent three months there, and it's this glorious three months and America just ceases to exist for us because we, we're treated just like like babies being cuddled by the mother. Oh. So now it's time to leave, and we're sitting with Jal in the hotel, and Jal had this way where he would say, what's on your mind? What's troubling you? And so we're, we're just getting ready to say goodbye, whether we're leaving in a day or the next day or two days, I don't remember, but he said, what's troubling you? I said, John, we're, we're going back to America now. We had spent everything to our last dollar. We borrowed money from Marshall to take a bus 
from Penn Station to Myrtle Beach, where we had left our cars. So we had our round trip air ticket we had bought. That was covered. We borrowed money from Marshall Hay. We got the bus here. We were going to pick up our car. We had no, we had no work. We had no place to. We didn't know where we were going to live. Dallas, what are you worried about? I said, Oh, we're going back to America. I said, I have no job, and we have we have no place to live. Myrtle Beach in the summer, even then, you couldn't rent the place. We were coming back. It was August. And Job pulled up his chair very close to me, shook his fist in my face. He said, what do you mean you don't have a job? He said, your job is loving Mayor Baba. Mm -hmm. And what do you care where you live? As long as Baba lives in your heart. And we got back here, just the way Baba does things. We got back here. We stayed at the, we, we managed to be able to stay at the center a few days. We were going to somehow rather really drive this leaky car back to Florida where we both had licenses to work. And uh, we're sitting with, uh, we were in the gateway. Debbie Meyer was at the phone. And she says, You guys are leaving, you need to stay. And we said, We can't stay, we have no job, we have no place to live, we have no money, we can't even rent the place. With that, the phone rings. And Debbie's on the phone. We start to leave. She said, no, wait just a minute. Don't go to this stuff. She's talking to whoever it is on the phone. She said, I'll send them over now. <laughs> it turned out that phone call was from uh, the a woman by the name of Claire Benning. If those of you knew Claire Benning, she met Bob in the 50s. She lived in Briarcliff here. Her father, uh, his name was C.F. Houston Miller, uh, the, one of the family heirs of the Lucan Steel fortune in Pennsylvania. He's fallen and broken his hip. He's 90-something years old. He's in the Myrtle Beach Manor. He needs a private duty nurse. That's the phone call from Claire Benning, his daughter. Is there a nurse there that needs a job? <laughs> Is Beth who had her nursing license. We go over for the interview and uh, he hires us and it was, <laughs> I do have to tell you, it was a little bit, so we were, we were younger, that was 30, 35 or something like that, Beth was 25, beautiful woman. And he's there with his, his attorney, his daughter, he's like this, he's like royalty beautiful hair, a silk scarf, his unlit pipe in his mouth. <laughs> and uh, he looks at that's like this, and he says to me, son, you go stand over there in that corner, please. <laughs> I go over there, and he looks at your mom, and he says, to me, turn around, please. Oh. <laughs> and she does. And then he turns to me, he said, young man, he said, you have to understand that my age it's purely aesthetic, it's not erotic. <laughs> he said, I don't know how they expect me to get well. He said, this is how you get better. <laughs> <laughs> so he hired us with an apartment. <laughs> with an apartment. And we went in that apartment, and there was a Linnaud painting of what? Baba. Yeah, yeah because she, which she ended up leaving. To, to me, which I have. Wow. So that's how Baba yeah. does things. So, yeah, he takes care of us. I can remember him too from Blue Hotel Store. <laughs> I used to I work in the dispensary in Marisot, and so somehow that would also lead to if someone was in the hospital, be in the hospital with them. In India, you often want to have one of your own people in the hospital to get food, and at least back in the late 70s and 80s, the hospital didn't provide food. Mm -hmm. And if you needed medication, the person, that your family attendant would go down and get the medication. So because of that, I got to be in the hospital with Padre and Erich and Nalaba. So when Jal was at his end, Mani asked me to go to Pune and stay in the hospital with Jal for a while. And 
So I think so I'd be part of the day and someone else would be part of the day. And, um, and John was not in good shape. He was, he was conscious, but he just was mostly like laying there. And from that, he went into a sort of a coma. Um, but I think that the twins came one day and they were, wanted to know where everything was. And so, and John was just, he's not talking much. He's mostly like this, you know, and you get him to take a few sips of something and food. He, I can't remember if he had an IV or, so might have been sort of said, and where's Giles Mickey Mouse, uh, Mickey Mouse watch? Where's Giles Mickey Mouse watch? Not Mickey Mouse. Space Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> like semi-conscious he came up to. <laughs> you know, it was a watch had some little mouse on it with a, you know. So cute. You know what mommy did at Child's End? No. I just found this out recently. Baba had said that mommy would be a perfect master. Another lifetime, I guess. Something like that. And uh, so I heard recently from somebody that was there at, at John's death. Monty was with him in the room. And John looked lucidly at Monty and asked her to free him. Mm. Monty yeah. did this. Mm. And John died. Oh. Oh. something like this and said, Jal, everything, if everything is done, you could take that to be mystical, or you, or you could also just take that to Mani doing a gesture that relieves him of some pain and, uh, and some anxiety, which you, know, you could take it either way. For me, the important thing with all of this, you have to go right back to, to the origin, and that is whatever chance you get, the mandali are not without influence even now. And so, you know, read, that's what I would suggest to anybody, read what you can. There are a lot of people now, new people coming to Baba, who have no idea who the mandali were. And uh, matter of fact, for me, I'll leave you with one parting story that Erich told in Mandali Hall, I'm sure you guys have heard it when somebody asked Erich fairly directly about their role with Baba and Baba lovers to come in the future. And Erich said, he said, you have to think of it like a parade. He said, Baba is the drum major. He said, now you've all seen a parade. He said, you know how the drum major, everybody stands perfectly still until the drum major takes that first step. He said, then there's a fraction of a second delay before the line, the first line takes a step. Then there's another fraction of a second delay. He said, now the parade's going on and the people at the back don't even know the parade has started. He said, and what happens when the parade stops? It's the same thing. He said, the, the drum major stops there's a fraction of a second delay, that row stops. He said, in the back, they're still marching. He said, when, for us, the Mandali, he said, when we die and we gain realization, not just die, because they, some of them will obviously come back, he said, but we gain realization, everybody moves up a row. something that Eric or Mani said or Bao. If you look back, you'll find, oh, Baba said that to him. Sure. He got everything from Baba. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, that's from teenagehood or whatever, they were living with Baba, and that was it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, <clears throat> the gestures, the intonation, the stories, all of that came from Baba. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you can imagine that Eric is telling a story. There's will Baba told the story. So you can imagine how animated Baba was in telling the story, telling these gestures, whatever. Well, almost, almost no. Only Anne, Anne, and maybe I don't know who else besides Anne actually met Baba. But you know, for the intellectual part of the mind, which is um, how do I believe this? Mani Erich, go here. I never met anyone like that who I'd always want to be around. You know, mm -hmm. and so I said, "Wow, well, Mayor Baba must have been something for them to be around <laughs> from the time they're teenagers." Your spiritual mayor Baba, but physical mayor Baba, you don't know someone unless you know them. Mm -hmm. I don't know you unless I meet, see you, and this vibe comes off of you. Or Eric, and you go, you know, Eric, Mani, go here, Mary. And so uh, ingrained in everyone's mind. Yeah. Jal did say one time about Eric, and I couldn't imagine, there were probably only two or three people on the planet who could have said, such a thing. He said, Erich doesn't know what he's talking about. He's new to Baba. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he's Baba's brother. He, was, he used to spy on Brother. I, I think, though, that some of the old timers, uh, again, all of that whole gang, Motley, whatever word, circle, whatever word you want to use, are, to me, really incredible. But to each other, they're not necessarily incredible. Yeah. <laughs> to Padre and Pendu, Eric is a young guy. Bao is the young. Bao is a yeah. great yeah. disciple of Mayor Baba. To the, to the older guy, he's a guy who came along back in the 50s, a young kid. You know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Baba had already worn out the complete set of Mandali. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I look at it, like wearing yeah. out a pair of shoes. He yeah. went through two sets of Mandali. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about all the, the, the ones that were there early, well, if you're talking about the 30s, there was a whole other batch. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like Pendu and Padre, to Pendu and Padre, Pendu once describing his life, he said, this, 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 and then Erich came and Erich also helped. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to Pendu, who had done a mountain of work, yeah. and um, then, so, you know, yes, Erich is Baba's close disciple, but it's not like he's going to say, I better go ask Erich what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Bao would introduce Erich as this is, uh, let's say, an official came or something, or this is Erich Jesuwal, a Mayor Baba's chief disciple. Because yeah. mm -hmm. Bao is, um, I don't know, 20 years younger than him. Maybe not 20, but he's a lot younger than him. Bao mm -hmm. told me one time that he was still. He said, I have so much to learn about love. And he told me this story. He was, he was in Maribad, and um, Bao had just arranged for the purchase of some farmland. <clears throat> and the deal was already done. The contracts were signed. The fellow had received his money. And the farmer shows up. And he's accusing Bao of tricking him into the sale. And he's got a policeman with him. And he's insisting that he's been taken advantage of. And Bao said he's out there in the, and it's a hot day. They're outside and they're arguing. Outside, he's going, what do you mean I tricked you? You signed the documents. Here's the papers. And he's got, yes, but you were smart and you tricked me and whatever, but you arrested me. And it's with that, Padre comes over. And Padre's just standing there listening or watching it. And Padre then says, um, you know, it's so hot here. Why don't we go inside and have some tea? <laughs> Bao said the minute he did that, when they went inside, this fellow completely calmed down. Mm. And he said, Padre, that gesture of humanity rather than arguing with him, let's come have a cup of tea inside. The fellow ended up leaving, everything was fine. But Bao said to me, he said, I, have, I do not have the love that Padre had. He said, I have so much to learn yet. That's a good story. Great story. 
I like that message too that even the people that we want to hear stories about still say that they have so much to learn that we all it's humbling for us as well just when we because I think at least for me there's a tendency of every once in a while and probably more frequently than I want to admit I think oh I know about Baba it's, it's a lot cooler than what a lot of people know <laughs> you know and I get this idea like I know what other people don't know and that means I'm more advanced or you know oh that's just so sad that they're still so limited you know but it's humbling that we all I mean that's a sign of that that more growth is needed <laughs> you know the ego is is persistent I've got it one is, yeah but it's not about the mandali it's about Baba but I'm piggybacking on what um, excuse me I'm freezing it's I'm piggybacking on what Nick was saying about getting the apartment and getting a job um, this was back in I'm a newcomer to Baba uh, this was back in 86, 84, 84, when I'd been a seeker for a long time. And I'd studied with several teachers, and I'd been in a couple spiritual work groups. And I was living in Oregon and studying with a teacher there. And then our whole group decided to move to Atlanta to get a I just study with a teacher there, including our teacher, who was kidding. He didn't want to study with that guy, so he stopped in San Fran, worked with punk rockers. Anyway, I came to Oregon and studied with this teacher. Now, I had been unemployed the last two years in Oregon. The first two years in Atlanta, I was unemployed. In fact, all 50 of us who came from Atlanta couldn't, came from Oregon couldn't find work. I think they expected us to ride ponies and shoot Indians. Anyway, um, <laughs> after about a year and a half, I left that teacher. It was terrible. And that's when Baba picked me up, tapped me on the shoulder, although I didn't know that's what was going on. But I was walking down the street one day, and after I'd left, telling my friend who'd also come from Oregon that I wanted to go on a spiritual retreat because I'd had a long-term temp job and it had just ended and I saved a little money. And so I said, I want to go to the coast, but I don't want to be in a motel. I'd like to be in a little cabin and I don't want to be on the beach. I'd like to be in the woods and I can't spend more than $50 for the week. And she said, oh, sounds like you want to go to the mayor center. <laughs> and I said, what's that? And she said, well, I haven't been there. But a friend of mine told me about it. So I called and I went for a week and stayed 16 days. And when I left, Baba showed me a little bit of his humor because the cost on center was $7 for the first night, first week, and then it went up to $8. So I got my week for under 50. Uh, but when I got home, I had a call on my answering machine that led to permanent employment until I retired. Mm -hmm. And I had not asked Baba for this because I, although I was really impressed with Baba when I met him on center, um, I didn't accept him as God because I didn't believe in God. Or I didn't think I did, I was trying to kill him. <laughs> um, but I knew my search was over and the real work could begin and that was enough for Baba. So it wasn't a mandali that got me a job, it was Baba. And that job lasted till I retired and moved here. So that's wow. the story. It's a good story. I remember a joke that Joel told me, and I think it was one of those jokes that he told everybody. So anybody here that met Joel may remember this joke. So this is for everybody else. Uh, he said, during World War II, there was an American fighter pilot that was shot down over London. And you gotta forgive me, I'm terrible at telling jokes. <laughs> this American fighter pilot fell down, uh, was shot down over London. And uh, they rescued him, they dragged him out of the burning plane, brought him to the, uh, the hospital, and uh, he woke up many days later completely covered in bandages 
is in traction four ways and an, an extraordinary amount of pain. And he says, did I come here to die? Did I come here to die? And the nurse comes over to him and says, no, sweetie, you came here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> John's job was to tell jokes to Bob, uh, and that uh, uh, when they went to Hollywood later on, uh, as a for instance, Baba wanted as many of the Hollywood types as possible to come to um, the festivities that they were having, and <clears throat> Bob had gone to Paramount Studios he met Boris Karloff and invited Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein, but an old British theater actor. And Baba particularly wanted Boris Karloff to come to Pickfair, which was the home of Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, where they had the big reception for Baba. And um, Baba told Jal to invite Boris Karloff. And Boris Karloff declined. He said, I don't go to those types of things. Went back and told Baba, Baba said, you, he must come, you invite him. Mm -hmm. So Jal went and in his way, for those who knew Jal, yes, you know, you come, it'll be a good time. And he had his musical voice, just this lilt in his voice, which I wish I could, the twins can copy it. Mm -hmm. But um, Boris Karloff, no, 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 finally Boris Karloff, to get rid of Jal, said, well, he said, I'll make a deal with you. He said, if you can make me laugh, I will come tonight. And Bar the reason why Boris Karloff said this, he prided himself on being able to control his emotions because he was trained in the British theater. So he could be a monster as he was in Frankenstein, or he could be a, a lovely man when he wanted to be. And Jal apparently, whatever Jal told him, broke Boris Karloff up. <laughs> And Mani told me afterwards, not only did Boris Karlov come to pick fair, but he and John carried on correspondence until Boris Karlov's death. Wow. Said she found the trunk full of letters oh. from Boris Karlov. Wow. Um, and the way uh, John said his first episode, with, am I taking too much time? No. no. When Baba had told him to. Uh, he had, <laughs> I see I'm stimulating somebody back there. <laughs> no it's good, it's good, I, I love it. I fell asleep one time sitting across from Jal. He was talking to me, I fell asleep. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> um, but uh, John said he had no particular interest in being funny, that just wasn't his way. So they were in Man Manzilla Mean, and uh, Bob in his 20s, Jal is probably not even out of his teen years. And the, all the Bambali were on orders that whenever Baba would go any place, if he got up to leave, they immediately would have recalled, so whatever they were doing, whether they were in the toilet, whether they were cooking, they would have dropped everything and followed Baba. And Baba, who was Jalali at that time, apparently very fiery, he would just get up and go out of the, the, the door, leave the compound wander around for whatever reason. And at one point, that's what uh, Baba did, and all the Mandali, Pendu, Padri, Adi, Jal, they were all running after Baba. And Jal said, there's one particular time, Baba's just wandering off into outside of wherever it was, going with no buildings, there was nothing, it was deserted. And Jal said that, uh, Bob is walking ahead, and the men who are lagging along behind them, they're all grumbling. He said, because they haven't even tended the toilet, they haven't even had a cup of tea, nothing. They were just quickly threw on trousers and shirt and following Baba. And after a while, Baba calls Jal forward to walk with him a bit. He said, tell them a joke. He said, to lighten the mood. And Jal said, now, how am I going to do this? I don't know anything about telling jokes. But he had to come up with something. So they're walking on. 
jogged back with the men, and finally, Merwan, because Baba wasn't even called Meher Baba at the time, he said, Merwan, he said, I, I have a confession to make. And Baba and Jal said, now there was an excuse for Baba to stop. So they stop, and the men gather around, and Baba said, what is it? He said, Baba, I'm sorry. He said, I have a confession to make. He said, but he said, well, what? What, what did you do? What, what is this confession? He said, I stole something. <laughs> and Baba looked at him. He said, my brother? My brother, you steal something, and you're staying here with me? How could you do such a thing? He said, Baba, I didn't want to, but if I did not steal, I would be breaking your order. Mm -hmm. He said, how can you say such a thing? He said, I would never give an order to steal. He said, no, Baba, but I was left with no choice. And Baba said, now tell me exactly what happened. He said, well, you remember, Baba, last week, he said, when I was sick and I had to take some medicine? He said, yeah, I remember. He said, and now yesterday we stopped to get tea and I also have to have my medicine? He said, yes. He said, and on the medicine bottle, it said take two spoons with breakfast. So I had my tea and I took the two spoons. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, and he said, so after that, he became, uh, so that's why, yeah, if you get any opportunity to find out anything, um, and as a little aside, I have hours and hours and hours of uh, audio cassettes with Jal, uh, talking about his father, and a lot of it is different than what's in the printed book. Uh, so you read both and hear both. Which printed? There's a book at Cherry R Books about Cherry R, Baba's oh. father. There's some information. Can you, yeah, you feel it? Yeah, we're going to digitize it's, it, That's what I'm, it's being done. Huh? It's being done as we speak. Yeah. Right. Will you make it available? It's all going to be available. I have no interest in making any money on it. <clears throat> Jonathan Burroughs is transferring everything. I've oh, got great. about yeah. 10 hours of talks of Adi. Wow. Um, and little things, as a matter of fact, goes to your point, because there were things that the Mandali explained that I think Baba, they were too trivial for him. Like, for instance, there's a wonderful explanation where Adi, uh, Adi talks about the difference between uh, um, consciousness and awareness. And very often times, people use those words interchangeably. Adi gave a beautiful example. He said, uh, it, because ba Baba did say, all humans have equal consciousness. Mm -hmm. yeah? But we don't all have equal awareness. Right? The obvious would be a child and a parent. Okay? The, the parent is much more aware of things than the child. Right? But Adi said, think of it this way. He said, consciousness, he said, let's say that $10 represents consciousness. He said, you have $10, I have $10, we have equal consciousness. You know you have $10, I've forgotten that I have $10. You can use your consciousness. You can use that $10, I can't use it because I don't know that I have it. So those, he gave a beautiful distinction with backbiting. This is good. Okay, I'm all ears. <laughs> uh, different than gossip. Yeah. Baba did not like backbiting, but anybody who spent time with Kitty, you had to have gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Kitty loved gossip. She would send people, I had a little salon up here in North Myrtle Beach. She would send people up to get their hair cut, Elizabeth, because if you were not looking, if you were bedraggled men, she would tell them, Go get the oh. <laughs> And then I would, uh, Beth and I would take Kitty. Kitty loves to go out to dinner. And we're in Bill Ruba one evening waiting for Kitty. She links arms with us and she, she knew that I would always hear things in the salon. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, she's, uh, Elizabeth is in her bedroom in the back. We didn't even see Elizabeth's doors closed. 
and Kitty, barely above a whisper, says, oh, I hope you have some good gossip for me tonight. <laughs> and we hear Elizabeth from the back, Kitty, you won't gossip tonight now, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Adi said the difference, he said backbiting is if you have rancor in your heart. Mm. You know, so because, uh, and this I had seen come up on a practical basis, I remember sitting outside one time when, um, in the early days when Dr. Goer still had the clinic, uh, which was just one of the rooms at the end of Mondoli Hall. And the patients would sit there. And I, after it was clearing up, and I went over to sit down. And she said, no, no, don't sit there. She said, those people, those farmers are very crude. <laughs> and I thought to myself, is that backbiting? Mm -hmm. They called somebody crude, you know? But it's rancor in the heart. Mm -hmm. And as I have thought about that over the years, I can look at somebody with a smile on my face and say, God, you're such a credit to humanity. <laughs> but I may be harboring a lot of dislike and Bless your heart. Bless your heart, yeah. Bless your heart, that's me. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it's what's in your heart. Eric said if you love someone, you can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he said. Yeah. You can talk about it. Backbiting. Yeah. Because yeah. they can't be right, or if you love the person. Yeah. I hate when we have to cut short of fine parts. That was super duper fun, and we'll do it again. Thank you.